Hello, this is Tony Blazer back with another video for the Motocross Vault here on YouTube. Uh, for this one, what I'm going to do is we're going to cover the history of Fox Racing, uh, starting in 1974 up until uh, the year 2000. And how I'm going to do that is I'm going to go through uh, my collection of magazines here and go over some of the classic ads and uh, photos of some of the riders, uh, give you my thoughts on uh, what I thought each year of the gear, um, the different eras of their designs, um, last year I had done a uh, article for PulpMX.com covering some of that stuff in print and I had uh, Greg and Jeff Fox go through it with me and Pete as well and we kind of um, went back and forth a little bit. They told me a little bit about what was uh, significant about each one and uh, if you haven't read it, it's, it's a good read I think if I say so myself. Um, definitely worth checking out on Um But if you're like many of us who prefer to watch something more visually and get like more like a podcast type of deal where we go through it as opposed to reading it on the web, uh, this might be of interest to you. Uh, like I said, I'm going to go through starting in 1974 and up through the year 2000. And we'll go year by year, and I hope everyone enjoys it. So here, without further ado, is the history of Fox Racing. The origin of Fox Racing uh, goes back to the early 70s uh, with the founder, Jeff Fox, who is most certainly one of the most interesting people in the industry uh, in terms of his background before he got started into motocross and uh, motorcycle sales. Uh, Jeff was a physics professor at Santa Clara University, uh, in the late 60s, raising a, a young family. And he had uh, kind of dabbled in enduro motorcycles and a little bit of motocross stuff, um, but was not really uh, taking it seriously at the time. Uh, like I said, his main focus was teaching. Eventually, uh, Jeff would run into a gentleman by the name of Ian McLaughlin, I believe I'm pronouncing that name right, uh, who was a manager at a local Yamaha dealership he frequented. Uh, McLaughlin and Fox uh, became friends over their love of motorcycling, and within a few months, uh, the two were pretty regular riding buddies. Um, after about six months of riding and racing together, McLaughlin approached Jeff about striking out on their own and starting their own dealership. Um, at the time, Jeff thought that was not really feasible based on his teaching income, but he did agree to help uh, McLaughlin with flooring, which is basically uh, helping him buy product up front uh, in return for a little bit of an interest kickback at the end uh, at the dealership. Uh, this would go very well for Jeff, and within a few years, he and McLaughlin would take on another partner, Chuck Bullwinkle, and start a dealership of their own called Grand Prix Cycles. During this era at Grand Prix Cycles, Jeff would experience the first real success that would lead to the formation of Fox Racing a few years later. Uh, at the time, Grand Prix was a CZ dealership, uh, which was a Czech-built bike, um, and the vehicles came with very limited uh, service manuals. Uh, didn't really tell you much about how to work on them or uh, how to repair them. So Jeff had the bright idea to uh, take one apart, disassemble it, do some real nice photography, and do a step-by-step -step instruction on how to service the bike. Um, he sold this for $7.50, and it turned out to be a huge success. Uh, eventually, Fox would sell 5,000 of these 150-page manuals to grateful CZ owners. The eventual success of this service manual would lead Jeff to uh, the conclusion that the future of profitability for the dealership wasn't actually in selling motorcycles. It was actually in mail-order parts and accessories. Um, this would unfortunately lead to a bit of a disagreement with McLaughlin, who thought uh, it was a much better idea to try and open more dealerships to sell more motorcycles, not try and sell things like handlebars and stuff through the mail. Um, eventually this would come to an impasse between the two, and in 1973, Jeff would agree to be bought out of his share of Grand Prix Cycles. After leaving Grand Prix Cycles, Jeff and his wife uh, acquired a warehouse in Campbell, California, and opened the Motocross Fox, which was uh, the name of the business when it was first incorporated. Um, originally, Motocross Fox was strictly a mail-order company. Um, they sold all sort of um, different aftermarket parts and equipment, uh, but did not have anything that was really under their own name initially. As you can see here in 1974, uh, Fox, or the Motocross Fox, as it was called at the time, uh, didn't have an, a, a logo yet. Um, that iconic Fox head logo that uh, was the first image in the video here, 
uh, had not been uh, commissioned yet. It didn't make an appearance until a year later in 1975. Originally, Jeff had the feeling that a logo wasn't really necessary for his brand, but he was encouraged by the ad agency that they used to provide one. So he commissioned Bob Baptiste to draw something up for him. Uh, the logo cost him 300 bucks and certainly stands in one as the as one of the best investments in motocross history um, as even today if you see that logo uh, you definitely know it's fox racing after starting the mail order business one of the earliest successes of fox racing uh, was a rebuild kit for coney shocks uh, at the time even the most high-end shocks were not rebuildable and uh, jeff came up with a kit that allowed them to be serviced uh, in 1975 that would lead to the involvement of Jeff's older brother, Bob. Uh, Bob was a physicist and an engineer in his own right, and uh, Bob had designed an air shock uh, while actually tinkering in his buddy's garage um, and worked out a deal with Jeff to develop shocks for uh, the new company. Uh, long travel suspension at the time was just starting to take hold, and a Motocross Fox was in the perfect place at the perfect time to take advantage of the huge increase in interest in aftermarket suspension. To say the Fox Air Shock would turn out to be a major success would be quite an understatement. Uh, basically, in the late 70s, if you were running dual shocks, the shock to have was a Fox Air Shock. Um, it would find its way to all sorts of high-end motorcycles, including factory Hondas like the one you see here with uh, Brad Lackey running it in 1978. Um, I had one on my 78. Quite frankly, I never could figure out how to make it work right, uh, but my knowledge of the whole thing was very limited. Um, I think if you set it up right, it worked very well. Um, I'm sure it probably suffered from the same kind of stuff you'd have now where uh, as it got hot, air pressure would expand and what have you. This was early days, but it's pretty intriguing when you think uh, that they had this technology in the late 70s um, and then you still see people experimenting with it even today. Now here's a really cool ad from 1977. Uh, this one is highlighting Motocross Fox's new uh, race team. Uh, at the time, uh, Jeff had the idea that in order to expand their business, it might be a good idea to uh, start a team to get a little more uh, high profile for their brand. Uh, the original team uh, featured Mark Barnett, Pat Richter, who was actually one of the early development riders on the Airshock project, and Steve Wise. Uh, you can see them all here in this ad as well with uh, Barnett's 322 uh, Suzuki. Uh, when the team started, Motocross Fox was still primarily just a hard parts distributor. Um, they were selling you know, like things like handlebars and miscellaneous pieces for your motorcycle. Uh, but it turned out that gear uh, was going to be the big takeaway from the team. Uh, after everybody got a look at the cool uh, orange and yellow gear uh, the guys were riding, people started calling into Motocross Fox to see if they could get a set. Uh, and it didn't take Jeff very long to figure out that uh, there might be a little bit of money in making some uh, motocross gear. Now one interesting uh, thing you do notice in these early ads and catalogs for all the gear manufacturers actually is there's a lot of cross-pollination going on. Uh, if you look at this ad for uh, one of Fox's early boots, it's actually a Hallman boot, which is really the current Thor. Torsten Hallman Original Racewear is where the name Thor comes from. And this is a Hallman boot uh, being sold by Fox. Uh, Fox also sold JT Racing Gloves early on. Um, like I said, they weren't really able to stand on their own at this point. They really are selling uh, other people's products. Fox would eventually sell an, a version of an AXO boot as well. Um, they are really more of a distributor than an uh, actual manufacturer at this point, and these uh, early, early products uh, reflect that. In 1977, uh, Bob here featured uh, second from the left, and Jeff, who is dead center, uh, decided to separate... Motocross Fox into two separate companies. Um, Fox Factory Inc. would be the suspension end of the business run by Bob, and then Motocross Fox would continue to be a hard parts and uh, apparel supplier. Um, at the time, that seemed like a really great idea because uh, the whole suspension boom was in full swing. Long travel suspension was a big deal. Air suspension was a big deal. Uh, but actually, shortly after they made this uh, uh, split, the bottom fell out of the aftermarket shock business. Um, in 1977, Fox had sold 10,000 pairs of shocks, uh, but by 1980, that number had dwindled to a paltry 1,000. Um, in response to that precipitous downturn, uh, Bob Fox diversified his business 
And instead of folding up shop, he expanded his suspension business to include automotive, bicycle, um, and ATV applications. Uh, today, Fox um, Factory Holding Corp, as it's known today, the former Fox Factory Inc., is one of the largest publicly traded suspension companies in the world with a market cap over $1 billion. So um, that certainly turned out to be a pretty good move for Bob. Uh, and like I said, Fox, if you look at like a Ford Raptor or a high-end, even like a, a lot of high-end aftermarket trucks to this day, they're going to have Fox shocks on them. Uh, and that stall started right here in 1977. In 1979, Motocross Fox decided to get serious about uh, the gear business by partnering with Yoko out of Finland to produce a new line of gear uh, they called the Super Fox line. Uh, it featured a set of gloves, some pants, and uh, Super Fox boots. Uh, Yoko is well known for its quality and would later help companies like Axo Sport uh, expand into the gear business uh, in the early 80s. Um, the Super Fox line had Brad Lackey as one of their um, sponsored riders. Brad was the first high profile rider really to be paid by Fox Racing and uh, they had a long time relationship with Brad going all the way back uh, to the early 70s. Brad had been one of the early Fox Air Suspension um, testers uh, when they were first trying to break into that business and had been a, uh, one of the people running the Fox Air Shocks on the uh, GP circuit for several years. Um, Jeff told me though that uh, he thinks that emphasizing uh, GP, GP guys like uh, Brad and Graham Noyce probably wasn't a great marketing strategy in the late 70s uh, even in by this point which would be 1979-1980 era um, the interest here in America was already shifting towards the American riders and guys like uh, Bob Hanna, uh, Marty Smith were much more popular here. Um, the days of Roger DeCoster and Heike Mikula being real big draws in America were kind of drawing to a close and uh, by betting on uh, the GPs I think uh, Jeff felt like he maybe made a mistake there. While Fox may have missed the mark a bit by uh, backing Noyce and Lackey in the late 70s, they certainly hit a bullseye by getting Mark Barnett as he was just becoming a uh, star. Uh, Barnett was one of the early members of the original Motocross Fox squad, and when he finally got moved up to the factory Suzuki squad, he stayed on Fox. Uh, in the early 80s, Barnett was by far Fox's biggest star and uh, their main marquee rider. Um, if you check out one little interesting tidbit in this ad here in the lower left, you'll see uh, another guy that wasn't a star at the time, but would certainly go on to be one, is uh, David Bailey. Uh, you can see him here in the classic orange and red, uh, I'm sorry, yellow and red Fox stuff. Uh, although David was with Motocross Fox in the early 80s, um, he would switch to JT Racing by the time he became uh, really a big star uh, in 1983. In 1982, Fox released a couple of uh, big hits, uh, two of their most successful products of the early and mid-80s, the Dirt Paw and the Paw Tector Glove. Uh, the Dirt Paw was an inexpensive glove. It ran uh, $15 at the time. Um, I never had a set of those, but they uh, were decent looking uh, for their day. But for $4.50 more, you could get the Paw Tectors, which were much better looking gloves. Uh, I had several sets of these, loved them. Uh, Rick Johnson ran them, which always counted for a lot in my book. Uh, love these gloves. Uh, one more interesting tidbit for uh, 1982 is the switch to the new style logo. If you look here at the logo as it pops up on the lower right, you'll see that uh, it has both styles, both the Motocross Fox, which is the classic Motocross, and the uh, new Fox Head logo with the O replaced by the uh, original 1975 logo. Uh, this would kind of go this way for two more years, 84 and 85, and then in 86 uh, they would drop the motocross part of it completely and just go with the new school uh, Fox Head logo. In 1982, in addition to their own line of uh, boots, Fox actually sold a version of Axo Sports boots. Um, as you can see, these were not the most attractive boots. Uh, in fact, I think they're pretty much hideous and look like they belong on a stormtrooper. But, uh, like I said earlier, there's a lot of cross-pollination at the time. And Axo Sport was just trying to break into the gear business. They were basically exclusively a boot company uh, in the late 70s and early 80s. And it wasn't until uh, Jim Hale uh, kind of got them to branch out a couple of years after this in 84 that they started uh, doing a little more than this. So, 
uh, at this time you can buy this boot under the AXO name or the uh, Fox name as well. In 1982 Fox had quite a stable of riders under their tent. Uh, this poster was done by uh, French distributor of Fox Racing, Yves Cousin, um, and it, it shows the 82 uh, sponsored riders in Fox's stable. Uh, from left to right, it shows Mark Barnett, uh, World Trials champ Gilles, or Gilles Bergat, sorry if I'm butchering your name there, uh, Mike Guerrera, David Bailey, Donna, Donnie Cantalupi, uh, Michele Rinaldi, the great Hawk and Carlquist, uh, Graham Noyce, and Brad Lackey. In 1983, uh, Jeff Fox partnered up with Kenny Roberts and Brad Lackey uh, to introduce a new line of casual wear called Fox Action Wear. Um, as you can see, the styles were very different in 1983. The shorts are extremely short and extremely tight. Um, I can't imagine wearing this stuff today, but I'm sure I was wearing something similar in 1983. Um, in spite of having such star power as a world champion road racer and a world champion motocross racer, uh, this stuff didn't take off. Um, from talking to Jeff, he thought maybe it was maybe a little too bit uh, too before its time because obviously this kind of stuff now is all over the place, a big hit. But uh, in '83, it didn't really take off for Fox, and uh, they canceled it pretty quickly. In 1983, uh, Mark Barnett was still uh, by far Fox's biggest star. Uh, but one interesting thing you'll see in the ads from this era is uh, Barnett's presence seems to kind of wane a little bit. Uh, at the time, apparently, it was becoming more difficult to get him to come out to do photo shoots. Uh, he was much more interested in uh, burning 8 million laps through his RM125. So uh, you'll start seeing guys like uh, Greg Fox's kids uh, show up in the ads, which is interesting. Here is an example of what I'm talking about. Uh, if you look to the right of the page, the two gentlemen in the retro Fox gear are Greg and Pete Fox, uh, two of the older sons of Jeff, who would go on to run the company after Jeff kind of stepped away from things a few years later. Um, one interesting thing about this ad is the fact that, it, good lord, is it busy. That background is hideous. And uh, the reason that it's hideous is because the gentleman who had been handling Fox's ads uh, prior to this, a gentleman by the name of Jack Lawner, um, died after a routine uh, hospital surgery uh, right before this. And uh, that left Jeff with the uh, responsibility to lay out the ads in-house. So he did that for a little while. Um, and I guess maybe he didn't realize that was a terrible idea to put these red foxes all over them. There's several of these ads, and they're all just as ugly as this one. Um, it basically gives you a migraine. So uh, obviously once Pete got a little older, he took over uh, the artistic end of things and did a much better job at it than uh, his physicist dad. Here's an ad from 1985. Uh, this is kind of an interesting transition point for Fox. This is just before uh, Pete really comes on board uh, doing a lot more of the styling stuff. Uh, he had designed the Roost Deflector, which was their um, chest protector they had had in 84 and 85. Not one of my favorite designs, but uh, at this point he's really starting to assert his muscle. I think he's about 16 at this point, which is pretty crazy, but... Uh, you'll see the influence of his designs pretty quickly. Uh, one thing I think is cool about this ad is uh, if you notice the logo design, it's very reminiscent of Miami Vice, which, uh, depending on your age, may or may not mean anything. But in 1983, 84, era, um, 85, right around this point, uh, Miami Vice was quite a big deal. I guess 84 was maybe the first year of it, but uh, it was a huge deal on NBC. Uh, had that kind of uh, Miami... Uh, look to the pastels and the colors, and this uh, logo kind of reflects that. Uh, and this also is a pretty cool look at the paw tactors, which were, uh, like I said, some really great gloves at the time. All right, here's another ad from 1985. Uh, this one highlights m my all-time favorite motocross rider, Rick Johnson, who was a new hire to uh, Fox Racing in 1985. He was, had moved from uh, Cinesalo and was coming off the uh, 1984-250 National Motocross title. Uh, so he'd be running the number one in the outdoors. Um, you can see this gear, I didn't really like it that much. The 85 stuff's kind of boring. Um, nothing really spectacular. That roost deflector you can see in the upper left is a pretty lackluster design in my opinion. Uh, one of Pete Fox's early designs wasn't his best. Uh, you do see the nice paw detectors in the lower left. And if you look at the upper left, uh, you can see Fox Racing's new 
uh, logo design. Uh, like I said, they were transitioning from the Motocross Moto X uh, logo um, to this new Fox Racing logo, and uh, you can see basically how the uh, the new stuff's going to look. Um, it, what's interesting too to me is um, if you look at Ricky. It's amazing how different he looks here, from the hair to the clothes to even the, the silly posy striking on the right. It just doesn't look anything like the guy you'd see in 1986. A year later, he's uh, cool, confident, and uh, just the baddest dude on a motorcycle. And uh, here, although Ricky was certainly plenty fast in 85, he just doesn't quite have that look um, to go with his uh, speed on the track. All right, here we go. Time to buckle up your seat belts because I don't know if there's ever been a more impressive year-over-year -year change in a gear line than there was from 1985 to 1986 in Fox Racing. Uh, this, like I said, is when Pete Fox really starts to um, assert himself in the design sense at Fox. And uh, his amazing style sense really shows in all the products that year. Everything from... The new stadium jerseys to the uh, Comp 2 boots um, to the Roost 2 chest protector. Um, pretty much everything is just really phenomenal that year. I personally had that uh, Rick Johnson replica blue stadium jersey. Uh, I lent it to a friend back in high school and I've never got it back and I still kick myself in the rear for that one. Um, I wanted a Roost 2. I never had one. Um, I've always been a somewhat of larger carriage, and the chest protector thing never really felt comfortable. I always rode up and choked me, but I always wanted to look like Ricky Johnson. Um, those Comp 2 boots were actually built by Alpine Star. Again, uh, Fox was partnering with the, an Italian company to build their boots, but these came out about a bazillion percent better than these old Axo Sport ones. Uh, the Comp 2s were pretty much the, the gold standard at the time. They... Um, they had Velcro closures at the top, which people would laugh at now, but uh, they were pretty common for the time. Uh, and they were just so stylish and good looking. Uh, everything here is great. I mean, and if you look at Ricky, I mean, just look at his style from the um, his gear to his haircut to his poses. I mean, it's just so interesting. Uh, I know Pete uh, did all these ads and the layout on them, and the, the they just show such an artistic flair. Um, there's even an early, uh, very young Damon Bradshaw on one of these ads that's uh, interesting to see, too. At this point, he was still on minis, but uh, he was one of Fox's up-and-coming riders. But uh, this stuff is so phenomenal. It's it's great looking. It looks, really, to me, it looks as great now as it did then. I mean, I'm an old man. I guess I'm almost 50, but uh, I thought this stuff was awesome in high school. And uh, I bet if you, you know, if you sold most of it today, it would still sell like crazy. It looks better than most of the crap that's out there now. So definitely timeless and uh, one of Fox's best years and some of the best era for gear period. After a rather uneventful 1987, uh, Fox made a couple of uh, big moves in 1988. Uh, the first one was the uh, new Paw 2 glove. This was a direct competitor to AXO Sports' incredibly successful Series 29 glove. Uh, they were the first one to sh uh, use an injection molded plastic backing on the glove. Uh, which would horrify most modern riders now who basically want nothing on their hand at all. Uh, but at the time, uh, I guess in the 80s, they actually we actually wanted kidney belts and uh, hands not to be broken by rocks. So uh, plastic-backed gloves were a big thing for a little while. Uh, JT Racing had a uh, similar glove. I think it was called the Flexon. And then uh, Fox came out with the Paw 2 here in 1988. Uh, pretty good-looking glove. Uh, I tried it. I think I still prefer just the regular foam-backed Paw Tector. Uh, but, like I said, it was uh, basically a direct copy of what Axo Sport had done before. The next big splash Fox made in 88 was actually not a product, but an ad. Um, this one was uh, done by Pete Fox, who shot it, and it featured uh, national champion Rick Johnson uh, doing a kind of a take off of uh, Rodin's Thinker, a very famous sculpture. Uh, it shows Rick here wearing nothing to his credit, brave man, uh, except a Fox Comp 2 boot. And you can see just how incredibly fit Rick was at the time. This was at the height of his powers. Um, he was coming off, you know, multiple uh, national and supercross titles. Um, basically, 
this was about as good as Rick would ever get. Uh, he would break his wrist a year after this and kind of uh, put his career in a downward spiral. But in 88, he was the man. And uh, it took took serious balls to do this ad. Um, Pete, you know, God bless him for having the nerve to try it. And then God bless Rick for having the nerve to do it. Uh, it's probably one of the most iconic motocross ads of all time. Um, and definitely one of the coolest ads of the era. After the Thinker ad... Fox launched its second bombshell of the year at uh, Unadilla in July, uh, debuting a all-new type of gear um, on Rick Johnson, uh, the new Zebra Print Image Racewear. Uh, this stuff was absolutely insane. Uh, ba basically, nobody had ever seen anything quite like it. Um, at the time, you had a few kind of avant-garde designs. Uh, JT Racing was kind of pushing the envelope with uh, like a Bad Bones look. Um, you also had uh, like a Dalmatian line. There were a few other ones that were out there that are kind of concurrent to this, um, but nothing quite as out there as these uh, blue and pink safari pants. Um, I got to be honest, as soon as I saw these things, I had to have a set. I wanted them so bad. Um, you have to give Rick Johnson credit because, like I said at the time, this stuff was pretty crazy. Now we think of it as being uh, really indicative of the era, how it was, you know, hugely popular in hindsight. But when Pete approached Rick about wearing this stuff, he easily could have said, hell no. Uh, in fact, uh, Pete says his early designs had a lot more zebra print to them or a little more crazy even than this. But uh, to me... These kind of the combination of the colors, the the, the blue and the magenta pink, um, it, it all works even though it shouldn't. I mean, if you look at it, it's it ought to be ridiculous, but somehow it's not. It's just perfect for motocross, and uh, this stuff was um, really, really, really popular. Um, Ricky was the first guy to run it. Uh, unfortunately, he was getting ready to make a switch uh, at the end of '88. Honda got the bright idea to start pushing their terrible TX-10 line, um, which was produced by uh, both Axis Sport and Answer. Each of them had a version of it. It was like their in-house gear. And they tried to make all their riders wear it. Um, Ricky had a deal with Fox. Um, there was a dispute between Fox and Honda over the whole thing. And uh, he ended up just saying screw it all and going with JT Racing, uh, which was an interesting turn. Um, but anyway... This gear is much more synonymous with uh, Damon Bradshaw, who would uh, move to the factory Yamaha team in 89 and run it in 89. Uh, but it was actually Ricky who ran this. He ran it here and then in a couple of uh, European Supercrosses as well before making the switch to JT. Um, like I said, it's much more associated with Damon uh, Bradshaw, but uh, Ricky was the guy to debut it. And, uh, man, this stuff was uh, so popular. I think even to this day, uh, Fox Racing has never sold more gear uh, than they did of this this particular image racewear. In addition to the uh, really awesome pink and blue, you could get the Safari, uh, actually Zebra, Safari was the seat racing seat at the time, uh, the Zebra print um, in a blue. Um, they also offered a couple of different designs, which uh, this polka dot, black and red polka dot, which looked pretty cool, um, and this kind of a grid pattern. Um, was never a fan of the green and blue here on the bottom. That uh, was run by Jeff Matasevich quite a bit. Um, but the red and blue above it was run by Donnie Schmidt, um, who was a privateer uh, on Hondas that year. And it did look pretty good with him. Um, by far my favorite, though, is still the uh, the classic pink and blue Safari, which uh, still looks good, like I said. Oh, I keep calling it Safari. Zebra print, sorry. Knowing they had a big hit on their hands uh, in 1989, Fox added some new colorways and a couple of new print designs to the image racewear stuff in uh, 1990. Uh, by far my favorite of the new stuff was this new spider web uh, in baby blue and flow pink. This was the choice of Jeff Matasevich most of the time. Uh, while he was leading most of the Supercross season that year, he looked phenomenal in this it looked great especially with his uh custom Troy designs helmet and the uh matching roost 2 in the flow pink really a really a good looking uh good looking set of gear uh really popped on the track i mean it, it literally glowed 
Um, awesome looking stuff. Uh, in addition to the new designs, you can still get the you know, traditional uh, zebra print here in uh, the baby blue or the red. And then uh, a really nice, did like that black and red polka dot gear there on the far right. Uh, that was a set that Damon would run from time to time. Uh, that looked pretty pretty uh, awesome as well, especially on the Yamaha. Matched the bike really nicely. Uh, 1990 was definitely a uh, a great year for Fox Racing. 1991 was a year of some uh, pretty big uh, changes at Fox. Uh, probably the most significant was the defection of their two top riders. Uh, Damon Bradshaw was uh, lured away to Axo Sport by Jim Hale. Um, at that point, Damon had been with Fox since he was an amateur, and it was... Uh, a uh, pretty pretty big move. Um, the other big defection was Jeff Matasevich, who was second uh, probably to Bradshaw on the team in terms of high profile. Uh, definitely one of Fox's elite riders. He was lured away by a pretty big money deal to RS Tai Chi out of Japan, uh, which was a manufacturer of um, mostly road race stuff. Uh, tai Chi, the guy behind it, had been one of the early development riders in the Honda Elsinore program in the early 70s. And he had kind of parlayed that into a, a business after his retirement. And uh, Matasevich, uh, along with Larry Ward and some other guys, um, Jean-Michel Bale got lured away to go into um, RS Tai Chi. Uh, I think, if I remember right, that whole deal went south a year later in 92. And uh, Chicken ended up back at Fox after uh, the Tai Chi deal didn't pan out in terms of payment. Um, in any case, uh, this was a pretty big, pretty big deal that year. Uh, another thing that changed significantly was uh, some of the style and the gear. Uh, that year, Pete at Fox came up with a couple of the more bold designs. After the success of the uh, uh, zebra print, uh, they went with this interesting um, kind of a skeleton look, which I never liked. Even in 1991, I thought it was kind of weird looking. Um, wasn't really my cup of tea, uh, but I know some people liked it even then. I always thought it was kind of funny when you think about a sport that uh, where you know broken bones are a constant concern. You have a, a skeleton on the outside. Um, the other new uh, graphic was this uh, barbed wire look uh, that uh, Jeff Matasevich here is running uh, in an ad before you know before the season before he switched. Um, not really my favorite. Neither one of these were particularly good looking in my opinion. Um, the pants that year were not bad. Uh, they were. Uh, bold colors, you can see here. The I really like the blue with the uh, kind of a pink, uh, and the pink and green was a great look as well. That was pretty good looking. The jerseys, you know, pretty fair. They're okay, not my favorite, but uh, as you can see, some of the classics are still in the stable. Um, like I said, Fox was trying to still capitalize on the uh, the popularity of the the print stuff in '89 and uh, '88, '90, and, 90, and uh, kind of trying to keep that business going. Uh, but you know. It was hard to keep innovating in that realm, and they were going to keep getting uh, a little more crazy here for a couple of years. I'd say of the, the three years where the prints were really big, um, 91 was probably my least favorite. One thing that was still in the stable in 91 was the Roost 2. Uh, I think it still looked great even then, even though it was, uh, what, five, six years on the market at this point. Um, the only real notable addition for 91 was uh, some graphics to go along with your barbed wire your bones or your spider webs or whatever to kind of spruce up the look but uh at least for me still one of the best looking uh chest protectors in the business at the time in 91 uh pete fox did have one innovative uh thing in his stable uh the new chameleon boot um now we know this boot to be one of the uh, biggest kind of flops that fox had um they had a, it seems like a good idea when you think about it that it in an era when you want to customize everything on your bike and your body and stuff, it'd be kind of cool to swap out all the logos with different colors and uh, combinations. But it turned out those little uh, plug-and-play uh, Fox logos and stuff, they, they tended to pop out on their own. Um, it never really caught on in the way the old uh, Comp 2 boot had. Um, certainly, at least for me, it wasn't as good looking of a boot. Uh, but I think the main thing was people weren't really that interested in buying different colored accessories for their boot and plugging them in. Um, at this point, uh, I think the the best boots on the market were probably an Alpine Stars or maybe the um, Axo was really coming on with the uh, RC uh, Turbo boots, which is the boots I had. I never had a set of these Chameleon ones. Um, I was an Axo man at this point, and uh, I love them. But I know from uh, talking to Pete that uh, this wasn't one of their most successful products. 
After the defection of Bradshaw and Matasevich in 91, uh, Fox was left without a major pro racer in uh, 92. Uh, their top pro was actually Ray Somo, um, but the guy you actually saw in most of their literature was uh, Robbie Raynard, who was still an amateur at this point, uh, a very highly touted amateur, uh, much like Bradshaw had been before, uh, and a lot of people definitely tapped him as one of the uh, future stars of the sport, but is it, it is interesting to see that uh, Fox really didn't have anybody on the pro ranks that year. I think they got kind of burned by the whole uh, money thing with Bradshaw going to AXO, um, and they really didn't want to kind of dive back in there. They had lost Rick Johnson to JT, and then uh, Damon a year or two later it had been kind of a sour thing, uh, I think, in their mind, and they really weren't uh, looking to jump right back in right away. Um, the 92 gear that year was, uh, this is where things get a little over the top for my, uh, in my opinion. Um, it seems like they basically threw every design that Pete had come up with from, uh, late 88 to through 92 into, uh, onto the gloves and pants and jerseys and just, it is, has so much stuff going on there. Now there are a few, a uh, few of them here that are pretty pretty cool. I mean, I think, I think they stand up now even uh, years later is looking pretty cool. But some of the stuff is a little bit much for my taste. With the pants here, you can see what I'm talking about in that uh, there's, uh, like I don't know, three or four different designs going on here with these 92 uh, FX pants. You have the barbed wire on the front, and then you have the, the zebra stripes on the inner knee. Um, crazy colors. It's just... It's just a lot. I, I know that they're trying to hang on to that uh, kind of image as being bold and cutting edge, and it just seems like he just threw everything at the wall in 92 to see what would stick. Now, on these jerseys, I think they're a little bit better. The um, the one that stands out to me is probably the best of these is uh, the, the spiderweb design there. I think that still looks pretty cool, particularly the green and the pink. Um, obviously, it's very 90s. Um, but I think that design is a little bit more interesting and unique um, in terms of the way it looks now. You know, it doesn't look terrible. Uh, the the pants with all the other stuff going on is a little bit much for me, um, but I think a lot of people would probably still run this stuff here today. Um, I was never a huge fan of this barbed wire look. I, I'm not sure what was, you know, to me barbed wire not a great thing to have on uh, on yourself, but I guess Pete thought it was cool, and uh, I imagine they probably sold a few of them that year. In the winter of 92, uh, Fox released uh, an all-new line of image race wear uh, that was a major departure from the kind of crazy stuff they had earlier in the year. Um, it was This is actually some of my favorite gear of the 90s and certainly some of my favorite Fox stuff. Um, I love this stuff. It's very monochromatic, much less of the crazy print stuff, just bold colors basically relying on the colors to do uh, most of the work as opposed to like some insane you know zebra prints and uh, all the other insanity that was going on in 91 or 92 um, I really like this stuff it was really good looking gear um, like I said nice color palette too the colorways are nice uh, you have a couple of different ones here I really cared for at the time the red was nice uh, that purple um, a buddy of mine had that purple stuff and it looked great at the time uh, really good looking gear and like I said a major uh, major step back in craziness from the uh, earlier 91-92 stuff. Starting from the time that uh, Pete took over uh, the ads, I always thought one of the real strengths of Fox, particularly in the uh, era when print was still uh, such a major component of advertising within the sport, uh, was their ads. They always had really uh, great ads, really high concept stuff, beautiful photography, and uh, just just really kind of stood out from the crowd at the time. Uh, something that I think uh, really made Fox stand out as a brand. And one of the things they came out with in 1992 was a really interesting ad campaign called Dream On. Um, you can see a couple of them here. This first one was done um, uh, with, uh, with Robbie Raynard actually burning some laps uh, at a practice track. Uh, and it's it's really interesting in that I think all of us can... Uh, you know, fantasize about having that perfect day on a perfect track and it's prepped and just beautiful and uh, we're the only guys on it. And I think uh, I remember Pete saying that he was uh, kind of standing up on a hill and looking down on the track as Robbie was uh, 
running a few kind of warm-up laps, getting ready for the photo shoot. Um, he actually shot the picture that was uh, a little while back in the catalog where he was on the cover of the catalog. Uh, was done this day as well. And uh, Pete was up on the far side of the track and actually kind of captured Robbie running kind of solitary out on the track and had the idea for these ads. Um, he ended up doing several different ones. Uh, there's one here with uh, Jeff Matasevich. Uh, after he made that return to Fox after the uh, RS Tai Chi fallout, he rode uh, for Fox in the GP that year, the 500 GP. Um, and then uh, another couple of them here with uh, their new hire, Doug Henry, who was um, basically coming back to the brand after being on a DGY Yamaha for a little while. Uh, Doug moved up to the factory Honda team in 93, and uh, he was probably you know their highest profile rider that year after... Uh, kind of a drought in 92 and 93 they had uh, both chicken um back on the brand and also actually chicken went to to extreme that year that's right i guess i guess jeff probably rode for them just at the end of the year after the uh, the fall of 92 after uh the tai chi thing fell out so in 93 um doug would be probably i guess i, I would be considered their premier rider that year um he certainly uh did them proud winning a 125 and 125 national and supercross title that season in 1993, the Roost II was still going strong and looking uh, as badass as ever. And there were a couple of new color combos. Um, the purple he won here on the left uh, went great with the new purple uh, image race wear that uh, you can see uh, previously some of the other guys wearing. And that uh, green colorway with the uh, pink shoulder pads was also a great look and uh, looked phenomenal with the gear. Um, extra points, of course, if you had a custom-painted helmet, but uh, even without it, it was a really good look in 93. In 94, Fox took another turn that I really, really uh, approved of and came out with some of my absolute favorite gear ever, probably. Uh, certainly my favorite Fox stuff of the 90s and uh, something that it stands out even today is just being really unique. They came out with a earth-toned look, uh, which was obviously kind of a uh, major departure from the neon stuff they had uh, been producing for the last, I don't know, five, six, seven years. Um, this stuff came in like the screen here that Doug Henry's wearing. Uh, there was also kind of a, uh, like a rust red, a couple different uh, versions of it, uh, this blue. It was some really good looking stuff. It was so understated. The designs, um, at least for as far as motocross gear goes, was very, very low-key. Uh, just good-looking stuff. Nice lines, great colors, and unique. Um, like I said, at a time when everybody else was going neon and bright, everything, um, this was kind of like a something that really set Fox apart from the crowd at the time. Um, I love the love the gear. I love these ads. It's kind of cool. Like you know, you have Doug out in the uh, in the woods here in New England or in a field somewhere. Uh, kind of showing a little bit of the how the earth tones, um, you know, kind of blend in and, and look great in those natural environments. Um, it was really good looking stuff. Uh, and like I said, it really stood uh, stood out. Uh, this forest green in particular was really good looking. Um, but I liked all the colorways. All, all these earth tones were really good. Um, if you wanted something a little different, they still had the more traditional colors as well. You could get your uh, your teal uh, teal blues and your purples and stuff like that. They even had a, a completely monochromatic gray uh, this year in uh, 93, um, which obviously not really my cup of tea. I always like bolder colors, but uh, if you really wanted to um, take the saturation out, that was always a color you could go with. Um, in addition to Doug Henry, you had uh, Ezra Lusk making the jump from MSR, uh, Malcolm Smith Racing, uh, in 93 to Fox Racing for 94. Um, Ezra was one of the top up-and-coming riders at uh, Suzuki at the time, and uh, he brought home a 125 Supercross title in 94 for Fox and Suzuki. Um, it's interesting, like I said earlier, Fox had been kind of bitten by some of these high-profile top guys uh, switching, so it seems like they went with uh, more of a grassroots approach. Guys like Raynard and uh, Henry and Lusk, kind of up-and-coming stars uh, that the movie they could groom and uh, kind of get to grow with the brand. Um, it certainly worked out well for them in 93 as both of their main guys brought home uh, titles that year. 
1994 is actually also the 20th anniversary of Fox Racing. They had uh, started the brand in 1974 as um, the Motocross Fox. And as a little anniversary uh, tip of the hat, they came out with some um, retro gear. And they, uh, the guys, top guys, Raynard and Lusk and uh, Doug Henry here ran it at the 1994 High Point National. Uh, as you can see, it's very reminiscent of the gear that uh, Mark Barnett and the original Motocross Fox team uh, ran in 1977 when they were on the Nationals. Um, still love this color combo. Looks great. Looks as great in 94 as it did in 77 or uh, 20, 2014 or whatever else they've uh, brought it out to uh, commemorate an anniversary. Good looking stuff. Um, I can't remember if you could actually buy it though. In, in 94, I didn't have the money to buy a set. I'm not even sure they offered it for sale. It may have uh, just been kind of a promotional deal, special one-off stuff, but uh, it looked great, and I certainly wanted a set, even if I couldn't have bought it. While strictly not gear-related, one other thing I did want to mention about Fox in 94 uh, was the uh, kind of super influential video they came out with called Terra Firma. Um, this was just about the time when uh, free-riding videos were just starting to take off. Uh, in the late 80s, uh, Gary Bailey, who was uh, David Bailey's stepdad, had produced uh, a few kind of free riding videos. Uh, one that I bought was uh, Pros at Practice and Play, which kind of showed Stanton and a bunch of other guys kind of playing around in uh, the hills and stuff. And it was a pretty cool video for the time, for sure. had some neat footage. Uh, but the music was terrible. Uh, graphics very 80s. It didn't, didn't uh, it had the riding, but not uh, basically the kind of style... Uh, but Terra Firma really um, melded that cold music video kind of feel with awesome music by bands like Alice in Chains and Pennywise and stuff with uh, some great free riding stuff by Ezra Lusk and uh, Doug Henry and um, guys like Robbie Raynard. It's, it was a really influential video. Um, certainly not nearly as kind of out there as uh, like the Krusty Demons and Dirt and, and some of the other ones that came later, Moto Triple X and stuff. Um, focused more on the racers, legitimate racers, as opposed to kind of the uh, kind of fringe guys like Seth and stuff. But um, there's no doubt it was very influential. They'd make seven or eight of these um, during the heyday of uh, VHS and stuff before everything kind of moved to the Internet. Uh, but at the time, Terra Firma, very influential. Uh, awesome video if you haven't seen it. Uh, I don't know what you're doing. You should pause this YouTube video right now and go watch it. Um, great film. And uh, certainly uh, one of the most influential things that Fox did in the 90s. After a couple of years of having uh, either no riders or only a couple, uh, Fox ended up with quite a um, large stable in 95. They had uh, Ezra Lust still coming back. They also added John Dowd. You had Kevin Windham, who was just turning pro at the time in 95. You had Robbie Raynard, who was still... Um, trying to fulfill that uh, promise. He had had several injuries, but uh, was one of those guys that would go super fast but uh, kept hurting his shoulders. Um, in addition to that, they also picked up all of factory Honda. In 95, um, Honda made a team clothing deal, um, kind of like what they had done with the TX-10 stuff where they in 89 where they had asked their, their riders to um, wear team clothing. This meant that um, all three guys, Steve Lampson, Jeremy McGrath and Doug Henry would all be on the same gear, and uh, Fox Racing ended up um, getting that contract, which is kind of interesting uh, if you consider that six years earlier they had lost their highest profile rider, um, Rick Johnson, in a uh, dispute over the whole team clothing thing. So at the time they're railing against it, and six years later they're the beneficiary of it. Um, a year later they would pick up uh, Yamaha as well. So in 96 they'd have Honda and Yamaha. Uh, under the Fox stable. While that TX-10 stuff that was uh, available in the late 80s and early 90s was pretty hideous, and I don't think anybody other than Jeff Stanton actually wore the stuff, um, this Red Riders gear that Fox came out with in partnership with Honda in 95 uh, was awesome. Um, you saw a lot of guys running it. I actually had the uh, glow red stuff here in the uh, middle with the purple. Um, I actually really wanted the yellow and uh, red stuff as well, but I couldn't afford more than one set of the, it was uh, pretty expensive. I mean, even if you consider that this gear in the, um, you know, the mid nineties basically cost what gear does now, 
you can see it's $150 then, which is probably the equivalent of, I don't know, $250 now or something crazy. Uh, it was pretty expensive then. Um, I had uh, the regular old uh, HC jersey, and I also had one of these FX ones as well. Uh, good looking stuff. It was back when uh, jerseys were made of cotton. It, it breathed a lot better than like a gel print or some of the other stuff that I'd had at the time with like the AXO stuff, which uh, just would, was like a sweat box. This was pretty comfortable stuff. Uh, looked great. Um, even the the rust bone stuff is uh, is unique and interesting and uh, just cool gear. Um, all the guys look good running it that year. Um, the Honda guys. I'm not sure if I like this or the 96 stuff better. I might lean towards 95, but uh, both of those years, uh, for my money, by far the best of all the Honda licensed stuff that uh, Fox did with them over the years. I, I think even now you can get some uh, uh, Honda licensed stuff, but none of it is as interesting and uh, cool looking as what they did here in 95. As to the rest of the 95 lineup, um, I really like it. It's there's a nice mix of the uh, traditional. <laughs> it's funny to say traditional, but traditional glow, uh, bright stuff here, like the glow r red here on the far left that match that um, that nice uh, Fox Honda stuff really well, as well as some of the uh, earth tone stuff. They still have the flow. I'm um, sorry, the forest green, which is a great look, um, and you have the rust as well. So a little bit of mix. If you wanted to under uh, understated, you could go with some of the earth tone stuff. If you wanted to be uh, bright and out there and look like Jeremy you went with like the glue red good looking stuff um, the jerseys I didn't really like as well as the pants the design on there is a little bit weird uh, for my taste uh, not not a giant fan of the this kind of sublimated Fox logo uh, built into this jersey or the, the uh, plain cotton version of it as well um, I will say that the uh, color combos look good I love the four screen and the roost 2 and the um, like I said, that uh, glow red looks great. It's a great uh, combination. Um, and they added, of course, the updated graphics to give the Roost 2 a little bit of a fresh appearance. Um, maybe getting a little old in the tooth at this point. Uh, it's about 10 years old. But for me, it still looks good. You know, I think it looks better than half the ones you'd find even today. So Roost 2 is kind of a timeless design like the old JT uh, V2000 and stuff. Uh, it hold up, held up well over the years. All right, here we are in 1996, and with the new season comes some new riders under the Fox stable. Um, in 1996, Yamaha was added to the team uh, rider deal that Fox had. So they had Honda and Yamaha, and with Yamaha came Damon Bradshaw, who was coming back from uh, his early retirement. He had come back briefly in 95 at the end of the season, kind of mid-year. I think High Point was the first race he did, but uh, he was on AXO still. Um, Looking pretty good in AXO, as a matter of fact. Uh, but with Yamaha signing for 96 to be a team sponsor, Damon was back with uh, Fox for the first time since 1990. Um, they did this cool little ad here with the rebel flag in the background. Damon always ran uh, the stars and bars on his uh, helmet and stuff. Not so sure this is fly today. Everybody's so sensitive to everything that they'd probably be offended by this. But uh, uh, Damon was always kind of a rebel, and uh, this uh, definitely went with his general attitude on the track. As I said earlier, uh, Honda was also back with Fox in 1996, and uh, they had some really great looking gear as well. Um, I love the wing design here on the uh, jerseys. Uh, they look great. A uh, little less color choice than there was the year before. Pretty much you just had this, this, uh, these two to choose from, but they're both good looks. Um, like I said, I think I prefer the 95 look, but uh, both Steve Lampson... Um, and Jeremy McGrath looked really great in the stuff this year. It didn't hurt that they were both winning literally everything. Uh, a lot of guys don't give uh, Lampson the credit he deserves for just how fast he was in this uh, like 94, 95, 96 era. Uh, before Carmichael kind of took off, uh, Lampson was the man. He really was kicking butt these years and uh, looked great in uh, Fox gear doing it. And, of course, McGrath only lost one Supercross race this year. He went, uh, I think, 14-1. and one. Um, and then should have won the outdoors too, probably, except he, uh, tried a stupid jump, um, at Washougal, if I remember right. Um, no, I mean, it was Millville. I think he crashed at Millville, trying an insane, trying to make a tabletop into a double, um, crashed, hurt his foot, and then, uh, basically threw away the title, kind of messed himself up. Um, he was really dominant that year, but, uh, they both look great. This is good looking stuff. Uh, the rest of the Fox line... Uh, pretty nice in 96. Not a bad looking uh, line in general. 
I like all of these colors, um, particularly the yellow and purple uh, in this RS jersey. I thought was a really nice, clean design. Far less um, busy than the 95 stuff. Um, the logo was simpler. It's not kind of so artsy. I didn't like this other jersey as much, this FX jersey. The design there wasn't really to my liking. It uh, more, remin more, more reminiscent of the 95 stuff I didn't care for as much. Uh, like I so said, the yellow and purple is pretty good look. None of the colors are bad. Um, just did not like this design as much as the RS. The RS is a much uh, cleaner looking uh, graphically to me. Uh, the pants, again, nice looking, nothing crazy. Uh, good colors, uh, nothing too outlandish. Simple design, just uh, clean, not too busy. Good looking stuff. In 1997, um, Fox Racing came out with this ad uh, featuring Doug Henry. And it is probably my all-time favorite motocross ad of any kind. Um, really, really a moving, powerful ad, kind of highlighting the commitment and the um, the adversity that motocross racers go through. Um, and Doug Henry highlighted that kind of heart. Uh, in 1995, Doug had uh, crashed and uh, at Bud's Creek and broken his back and had to go through surgery and sat out the majority of the 95 season. In 96, he came back kind of halfway through the year and uh, actually ended up winning a moto at Washougal um, after, sadly, Honda let him go. Yamaha picked him up. And in 97, uh, Doug was back and actually um, one of the best guys that year. He easily could have uh, been Supercross champion, but he ended up getting uh, his hand broken in a crash with uh, Jimmy Button uh, midway through the Supercross season when he was, I believe he was leading the points when he crashed. So um, this ad really uh, kind of highlights that commitment you can see the scar and then this little tagline uh, what's stopping you basically saying you know look at yourself in the mirror and uh, uh, see you know how how much effort you're willing to put into something really really moving powerful ad by Fox one of the most interesting uh, subplots about the 1997 season was the surprise move of Jeremy McGrath from factory Honda to uh, Suzuki of Troy. Uh, at the last minute, Jeremy had left Honda in a contract dispute, and uh, with only a couple of weeks to go before the season started, he kind of was scrambling for a ride and ended up um, going with Suzuki. Uh, at the time, Suzuki was certainly not considered a top-tier team, and uh, Jeremy, when he showed up there, had a lot of struggles. The bike was slow, the suspension, they had the right side up forks on his bike they were using at the time, which Worked awesome on the production bike, but uh, weren't really suitable for somebody in McGrath's talent on a Supercross track. Um, when Jeremy made the move, he ended up sticking with with uh, Fox. He had been wearing Fox the previous two years onto the factory Honda team, and he would uh, wear it almost to the 97 Supercross title. Uh, he'd have a few problems with his bike throughout the year. Ended up, I think, cutting his foot right before Charlotte. Kind of fluke stuff, and then had an issue with a clutch and a flat tire and a bunch of other nonsense. Ended up uh, kind of preventing him from winning that title, and uh, Jeff Emig would end up winning it. Uh, but the gear that year looked good. Uh, he may not have won very many races, but he looked good on the track. A lot of the credit to that goes to the gear in 97, which was really clean. I like this 360 race wear. Uh, like I said, again, uh, very similar to 1996. The designs are clean. Uh, it's not a lot of busy stuff. There's no crazy prints going on here or anything. Just nice, clean, colorful uh, gear. Uh, the pants were all nice colorways. I particularly like that Patriot, which is the red and blue you saw Jeremy wearing a lot. Uh, probably my favorite. Uh, the jerseys, both designs were clean as well. Not nearly as uh, kind of busy as the some of the earlier 90s stuff. Um, I think I kind of prefer the 96 version of this jersey um, but the 97 is not bad um, both of them are pretty good uh, looking uh, styles um, overall 97 was a pretty good year for Fox I, I like the gear uh, definitely one of my uh, favorites of the later part of the decade in 1998 uh, Jeremy McGrath would switch from uh, Suzuki of Troy after a one-year stint that didn't go so great uh, to Yamaha in uh, Chaparral um, making the move, he would stick with Fox Racing again. Uh, so in 98, he would be in Fox and looking great in this. Uh, I really love this orange and yellow colorway. Definitely a good-looking uh, set of gear. 
Uh, interesting. This interestingly, this would be Jeremy's last year on Fox, uh, because in '99 he would be making a switch to No Fear, um, in a project he had uh, worked been working with with Jess Sirwall. Um, they had uh, kind of branched No Fear out from a lifestyle brand into a uh, motocross gear company. Uh, he and uh, let's see, Sebastian Tortelli and Kevin Windham, I believe, were the first three in '99 uh, that made the jump. Uh, Jeremy would capture a uh, Supercross title here in 1998. Uh, his first one on Yamaha and his uh, first one since le uh, leaving uh, Honda. Um, Jeremy was going to capture several more for Yamaha, but uh, this first one was had to feel good after having such a tough 97. The 360 pants were back for 1998. Um, this design I don't like quite as well as 97. Uh, the stretch panels in the front, I think, uh, maybe detract from the look slightly, but it did make them, I'm sure, a little more comfortable. Uh, the yellow and orange is a good look. Um, the Patriot, still pretty good looking. Um, purple was interesting. Uh, purple was big in the 90s. Uh, pretty much all the bikes were covered in purple, so I'm sure they sold plenty of this purple stuff. Um, not bad looking, but maybe not my favorite of the 360 designs. The FX jersey was back for 1998 as well, and... Uh, Again, I like these colors, uh, the purple on purple, good look, green. All these are actually nice colorways, um, good looking stuff. I think I still prefer the 96 design, but I just kind of have a soft spot in my heart for that one. I had uh, a couple of pair of the 96 jerseys, and I never had these. Maybe if I'd owned a set, I'd feel differently. Good looking jersey, uh, just maybe not my favorite of these. I do really like the look of this new Aero jersey for 98. It's... Uh, Clean design, like I said, simple lines, great colors. Um, all this stuff's great. It's very monochromatic. Um, there's not nearly as much kind of busyness going on. Um, I do like this era of Fox in general. The the whole late 90s was a good look, a uh, good era for them. Kind of toned down the designs in general and went with nice solid prints. Uh, good looking stuff. Uh, definitely a great era for Fox. As I mentioned earlier, uh, 99 was a bit of a transition year for Fox because they lost Jeremy McGrath to No Fear. Uh, Jeremy was going off to help start that new brand. So the top rider in the Fox stable was the 125 national champion, Ricky Carmichael. Uh, Ricky this year was moving up to the 250 class um, in Supercross, but he would stay in the 125 class outdoors. Uh, now, this did lead to an interesting situation where um, Ricky was wearing Fox gear on the Pro Circuit team, one of the very few times that uh, Mitch has ever let that happen. I think the only other one that I can recall was when uh, Mikel Pichon wore JT in 1996. Um, Ricky would, of course, dominate again outdoors on the KX125, but have a pretty tough year indoors. Um, he would end up with uh, uh, several high-profile get-offs and spend a lot of that season looking just like this here, uh, kind of hanging on for dear life onto his motorcycle. Uh, it would take him a couple more years to figure that part of it out. Fox's other big gun in 1999 was uh, factory Honda's Ezra Lusk. Uh, Yogi had moved back to Fox uh, after a brief stint at Axosport uh, in 1997. Um, he had moved over to the factory Yamaha squad and uh, wore the team-issued uh, Fox gear then. When he made the switch to Honda in 98, he stayed on Fox and wore uh, the Red Riders Honda uh, gear. I will say that I don't really like this gear as much as like the 95, 96 stuff, but it's uh, it's not bad looking. Um, the uh, kind of Honda wing built into the graphics and the jerseys and stuff were, were pretty cool looking. It's pretty good looking stuff, like I said, but it's a lot more plain. It really, every set of gear was either red and white or uh, black and red. Uh, not a lot of variety. Uh, Yogi was really fast this year. He... Um, he actually gave uh, Carmichael, I'm not sorry, I gave McGrath a run for his money early in the season, uh, challenging him several times, but um, really could have been the Supercross champ that year, but uh, typical Yogi, he had a few problems, crashed out at uh, one of the rounds, getting a tough block stuck in his wheel. Basically, the same old story, super fast, but would throw points away at uh, rounds, and uh, you can't really do that with a guy like Jeremy McGrath in your class. you got to make uh, make every round count and score points every time. And Yogi was just never quite able to make that happen. But uh, he always looked phenomenal on the bike. Uh, super stylish rider. 
Uh, looked great in pretty much every kind of gear he ever wore, except maybe that first season on MSR was a little dicey in my opinion. But uh, most of the time, Ezra was uh, uh, looked great on the bike and uh, certainly hauled the mail on that Honda. Yamaha was back in blue again in 99 as well with uh, Jimmy Button, Doug Henry, and John Dowd uh, running the Fox Yamaha license gear. Um, I will say that I don't really care for this gear as much as the Honda stuff in that it's not unique in any way. It's basically the, sta uh, the standard uh, Fox gear, the standard 360 and uh, HC and RS jersey just with some uh, logos stuck on them. Um, I had this gear in 2000 and 2001, I think, uh, when I had my YZ400, and it was um, it was okay. I mean, like I said it's not not boring. Um, I'm sorry, not ugly, but it's not great either. It's just eh. Um, one of those things that uh, Yamaha had those rules where the gear really couldn't have much variety to it. It always had to be blue. Um, one of the issues that Chad Reed, I think, always had with the uh, wearing the stuff. Um, so it didn't really vary much. Uh, it just basically had the you know the Yamaha logo on it, stuck on a regular jersey. So not the most inspired design, but not not unattractive, just not amazing either. As to the gear itself in '99, I wasn't a super uh, big fan of this mild redesign to the 360 race pants. The uh, the kind of pinstripe on the side, not really my cup of tea. Um, the Fox logo is the classic Fox logo. That still looks good. Um, also, I'm just not really a big fan of this any of these colorways. Um, I love the yellow when it had like the blue and stuff in it, uh, but this yellow and gray, not really my cup of tea. Um, I did like both the jersey designs, though. Both the 99FX and RS jersey um, are good-looking designs, clean. I particularly like the RS. I really like that design. Um, like I said, the yellow with the blue, I like that way better than the yellow with the gray. Not a big fan of that. Um, the red and blue is okay looking. Like I said, none of these are really my favorite. The the green that year was kind of a you know a dark forest green. It's okay. I mean, it's none of it's bad. It doesn't look goofy or anything crazy, but maybe not my favorite year for uh, the Fox overall palette in the 90s. 2000 was a great year for Fox Racing. Um, they had Ricky Carmichael moving up um, to the 250s outdoors and dominating his way to the uh, first of his 250 National Motocross titles. And Fox had some great ads this year as well. Um, I really, really like these uh, Motocross Starts Here ads. Uh, they're kind of reminiscent of the old Dream On stuff from the uh, early 90s. They show kind of action shots and uh, kind of show the the grueling conditions of motocross. This first one here is a Ricky Carmichael. Um, looks like maybe Millville, I'm not sure, uh, but some, there's some really deep ruts there and uh, shows kind of his perfect form and commitment there in the ruts. Great colors. Love this gear too. The gear in 2000 was really good looking stuff. Um, definitely one of the better years for Fox Racing. Um, this early 2000s, actually, all this stuff in the early 2000s was pretty good looking stuff. This uh, second one of these motocross starts here ads has Ricky Carmichael. Looks to me maybe like Southwick, kind of fighting that cowie in the sand. Uh, those Kawasaki's, uh, especially the late 90s, um, early 2000s, they weren't the best handling bikes on the track. They're kind of uh, big, tall, heavy bikes. Um, kind of difficult to kind of get them to shred in the turns. I'm sure Ricky's bike had a lot of trick stuff on it to get it to work, but uh, it wasn't the most nimble machine on the track. Kind of one of the reasons Ricky made the movie set in uh, 2002 to Honda was how kind of far behind Kawasaki had f fell in terms of technology and uh, the development on the bikes. Um, who knows if that's true, and I'm sure money had something to do with it, but uh, there's no doubt the Cowies were getting a little long in the tooth at that point. The next two versions of this ad um, have David Villeman as the star of them. Uh, DV was just coming from Europe in 2000. He was uh, new to the factory Yamaha squad. He'd ridden the GPs in 99. And he came out uh, really on fire. He was uh, surprised a lot of people with his speed in Supercross, um, challenging Jeremy McGrath. I think that, uh, like I said, took a lot of people by surprise, including Jeremy. Um, in 2000-2001, DV wasn't really uh, able to pull it off as far as the Supercross title goes. But in 02, he was real close. Um, he had... Uh, won the first couple of rounds and uh, unfortunately crashed doing a Transworld 
photo shoot before Daytona and separate his shoulder probably cost him the title. Um, DV was never quite as good outdoors as indoors, but he did, uh, I think he actually won this uh, a round or two outdoors, particularly here in the mud. In 2000, in addition to uh, David Villeman, we had Jimmy Button on the Fat Yama squad, and uh, he was riding the uh, YZ426. By this point, Doug Henry had uh, officially uh, retired, uh, and Button was the designated uh, thumper rider there at Yamaha. The 426 was, was a beastly machine and uh, definitely took a lot of nerve to ride that thing in Supercross. Uh, this Yamaha gear in 2000, uh, the blue stuff, very similar to what they had in uh, 2000, sorry, 99. There was some subtle changes. The logo now has more of a stylized uh, feel to it. It kind of tapers down. And that gives it kind of a new appearance. It's kind of fresh to look a little bit. Um, one thing I did really like for 2000 was the addition of a all-new colorway in the Yamaha gear. Uh, Yamaha of Troy uh, was Yamaha's support team. Uh, they had transitioned from Hondas to Yamahas in, I think, 99, if I remember right. Um, and this year they had a really cool blue and orange colorway that I loved. I, I definitely, um, I had this the middle blue and orange jersey here. Uh, definitely a good look. I remember Roncada was hauling the mail that year, almost uh, beat out Travis Pastrana for the uh, outdoor title and actually won the um, indoor title in the 125 class that year and he looked great. This was some good looking stuff and uh, although the normal Yamaha team couldn't wear it, uh, Yamaha of Troy definitely looked good in it. In 2000, uh, Ezra Lusk was back on factory Honda um, in the Red Riders gear but unfortunately Yogi would uh, have a tough season that year. At the first round he would end up crashing with John Dowd in practice and uh, separate his shoulder effectively ending any shot he would have at the uh, Supercross title that year. Uh, probably his best shot considering after this it really was kind of downhill in his career. Um, this year's Honda gear was similar to 99. Um, I don't like it as well as 99. The uh, kind of wing look is um, definitely minimized in the uh, the graphics on the side. Not quite as clean. It's decent looking stuff, but uh, I do prefer uh, 99. I definitely would pick 99 over this. Um, there is one new uh, colorway that I do like better, though. This this new uh, gear that adds the yellow wing into it. Um, adds a little splash of color that I think the gear uh, definitely needs and, and really kind of brings it out. Um, I do like this. The, the yellow wing and the yellow Honda logo on the pants are definitely an improvement for nine, uh, for 2000. On the non-licensed side of things, um, I think there were some uh, improvements made for 2000 as well. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the Fox logo gets a little bit of a, um, a taper to it, uh, kind of stylized a little bit. Uh, it would become more prominent in later years. This one's pretty subtle, but uh, it has a nice look in these 360 uh, pants. Um, I do prefer this kind of a strobe design on the side as opposed to the pinstripes of 99. And I like this yellow and red colorway a lot. It's a good looking uh, set. Um, none of the other four shown here are really to my liking, but the yellow and red is, is pretty good looking stuff. In addition to the standard 360 race pant, there was a 360 Limited offered in 2000, and I really do like this design. I love this, actually. Um, I love the, the Fox logo on the leg. Instead of just saying Fox, it has the you know the classic Fox head logo on there, kind of simpler. Um, the colorways, to me, uh, to my liking, are a little better. I like, I, Of course, I love the blue and yellow. Always love this every year Fox did it. Uh, Good-looking pants. Um, the red and... Uh, blue as well, kind of the Patriot look is always uh, a good look for Fox. Uh, the overall design of these pants is nice. It's a little cleaner than the regular 360, um, black and yellow. All these colorways except the gray are definitely to my liking. And it's just a good looking pant. Um, I never had this set, but uh, I definitely would have been happy to run them. Paired with the 360 line was a new FX jersey for 2000. Um, love this. Love it, love it, love it. Very reminiscent of the uh, 96 stuff that I like so much. Uh, clean lines, nothing busy, just great color choices. The blue, yellow looks great. The Patriot, like I said, um, all this stuff looks good. Um, very, very clean, nice, uh, uncluttered graphics. Um, definitely a sweet jersey. Uh, definitely, definitely get a thumbs up from me. The RS jersey was the 100% cotton option in uh, 2000. Funny, you just don't see that anymore. I used to love cotton jerseys. Um, of course, the new stuff is. Uh, uh, more moisture wicking, but there's something to be said for the ni a nice cotton jersey. Um, this design I don't like quite as well, quite as well as the other one. It's uh, 
just not quite as clean. The strobe on the arms, I guess, does match the pants, but I just think uh, the other jersey is a little uh, less less busy to me. Uh, it does work well with the 360 pants, though. Either one of these jerseys would look good with uh, either one of those pants combos, but um, for my money, I prefer the other design. All right, big news for 2000. Uh, Fox finally has a new chest protector. After 15 years of the Roost 2, uh, they released the airframe. Um, I never had this one. It kind of reminds me a little bit of one of the early uh, 90s Extreme uh, chest protectors. had that clear Lexan. Um, it looked good at first, at least the uh, the Extreme when I had one, but it, it got beat pretty quick. It gets scratched, and uh, that clear stuff uh, doesn't hold up as well to <laughs> the beating. Um, I never had this uh, this particular chest protector, like I said. Um, I'm sure it made some improvements over the Roost 2. I don't think it's as good looking. It uh, looks like it has a little more protection. Um, like I said, someone who actually had it, owned it could probably comment on it better than me. But uh, it's not terrible looking, but certainly not anything to write home to mom about. And not the icon that the Roost 2 is. Amazingly, the Roost 2 was still in the Fox stable in 2000. Um, I will say that it does not look as uh, attractive to me with this kind of boring black shoulder pad look. It, it's not nearly as nicely color coordinated as it was in the early 90s. The colors are much more boring and muted. Without the neon and the contrasting colors, the, the Roost 2 is a little, uh, little dull. Um, but the design still holds up, and uh, shucks, for 15 years old, it uh, held up pretty well, i got to say. Um, I'm not sure what year they finally phased it out, but uh, it certainly had a great run. All right, we've reached the end of our look back at Fox Racing. I certainly hope you've enjoyed it. Um, Fox Racing is certainly one of the most uh, influential brands in the sport and one of my favorite motocross brands. Uh, I've had a lot of their gear over the years and uh, always always liked it. Um, if you're stuck with it this far, uh, you must be a hard, pretty hardcore moto nerd like myself, and I certainly appreciate you taking the time to watch and uh, listen to the video. Uh, if you do like it, uh, let me know in the comments, and uh, if I get enough response, maybe I'll do another one. Uh, maybe Axo next, or uh, Answer, one of the other brands I've uh, been working on. Um, this takes a lot of work, but if people enjoy it, I'm sure you're happy to put in the time to do it. So, again, thank you for watching, thank you for listening, and uh, subscribe to see more videos like this.